Join us. Circle the globe. The planet is your hunting paradise. And one man will show you the world as you've never seen it before. Danger won't stop him. Nature won't break him or prevent him from doing the impossible. Hunting the Earth with bow and arrow. Be there to share this adventure. The ultimate journey for the ultimate shot. Welcome to Canada, the country of wild majestic elk, huge moose, and dangerous grizzlies. In today's episode, we will visit the trophy room of a great acquaintance of ours that is a bow hunter. He will tell us more about the upcoming adventure. As you can see behind me, I've taken a few caribou with my archery equipment. I've been lucky to take all species of caribou from North America. The only one that I have that isn't in the archery record books is a woodland caribou. We're headed to Newfoundland and this is my third attempt to accomplish that feat. So there's a lot of anticipation and excitement as we get ready for a woodland caribou hunt and a trophy moose hunt in central Newfoundland. I, Vladimir Donchev, together with Archie Nesbitt, was invited to hunt by our generous host from Big River Camps in Newfoundland. The newly found land, the way its literal translation goes, is the largest Canadian island and is a province along the eastern coastline of the Atlantic Ocean. Its area is 109,000 kilometers squared, which is a little bit less than the territory of my homeland, Bulgaria. We will be hunting at 10 to 15 kilometers from the shore in a territory where no one has hunted for eight years. Our hospitable and friendly host welcomed us at the airport. We traveled to the local aircraft base. That was the place from which the hunters headed in different directions by either helicopter or float plane to get to their remote hunting region. Hiscox Habitat. Oh, hot coffee in the cabin? Yeah. Where we are? Starbucks. <laughs> no, you're we're right. In, we're in uh, Eastern Newfoundland. You're at Iscox Habitat. Iscox, Iscox Habitat. Yes, there you are. <laughs> well, see, we saw the sign. I, I didn't uh, look at it too close, but it says it on the door. On the front of the cabin, right? Southwest coast of Newfoundland. Southwest coast. This is the, the closed seasons for Newfoundland in 1936 wow. for fur, game, and inland fish. And I had a frame, but it kind of slipped a bit, you know, in, in the frame. But it's, uh, I found it in an old trapper's cabin that was falling down years and years ago. Awesome, she was and I took it. The whole place in there was soaked with hunting memories and pieces of Newfoundland's hunting history. What better place to start a hunting adventure? We didn't have to wait for long and the helicopter arrived, loaded with happy hunters coming back from some camp. That's our bird. It's not very far to camp. It's only about 20 minutes. Uh, everybody's excited. This is the first year in about 10 that this hunt has happened at this camp. There's been no hunting in this area and we're the first group of hunters. Two bow hunters, one rifle hunter, but it's uh, a new camp, new construction, new facilities. Uh, they said they've seen caribou, they said they've seen some big bulls. And uh, there should be lots of moose because there's moose here everywhere. There's been three bulls right around this cabin right where this helicopter is. So it should be a great hunt. The weather's beautiful and we'll get some rain, but uh, we'll get some great days. So stay tuned for some ultimate shots. This is a mature woodland caribou. 
Sometimes they just don't have the top. And you know, you score the two longest top tines, so this is a little short here. Got some deductions because he's really short here and a long one here. But he's got beautiful bez and he's a double shovel. And that's a pretty good shovel. Pretty long. So hopefully we see something like this or a little bit. The place towards which we were flying was remote. The previous outfitter, Robert Skinner, of that hunting territory had passed away, but the hunting guides from the local population were still available. The new outfitter was obviously a person with ambition because the lodge we saw from the helicopter and where our hosts were about to accommodate us rather looked like a two-story, five-star lodge with enough rooms to fit at least four hunters. Next to our lodge, at the shore of the crystal clear lake, there were another two buildings. We arrived at the lodge by helicopter, but saw on the dock in front of the lodge a turbine-powered beaver amphibious plane. Obviously, our hosts have insured themselves against the weather changes, and soon we found out it was quite capricious and changeable. It must be Russian, is it? Not really. No. Bulgaria, next to Russian. But they can speak Russian. They can speak Russian. Yeah. Yeah. After our successful arrival, the helicopter was about to depart for supplies. They were going to deliver us everything we needed, so that in the upcoming week, even if the weather was bad, we would have enough food. Even before the airplane took off, we saw several bulls. They were all quickly preparing their weapons. In this case, Archie had a hidden ace in his sleeve and was quick to show it to us. Yes. My <laughs> Montana decoy. Isn't she pretty? The delivery of supplies and equipment took more than an hour, and while we were still trying to assemble a target for shooting the bow, from the float plane they brought us a brand new professionally made target. Yet Ed decided to take advantage of the efforts of our polite hosts and demonstrated precision in shooting to be envied at more than 30 meters. After we got everything we needed, the float plane was about to take off and find shelter in its indoor hangar away from the strong winds and the poor weather ahead of us in the days to come.
It was about time for Archie to check his bow's accuracy. The hunter didn't want to show the others his attempts from 60 to 70 meters, so he found a secluded clearing behind camp. A grouse became an accidental witness of the scene. The distant shots that Archie had practiced for already half a year were about to improve his chances of luck in the search for the desired caribou during this third attempt here in Newfoundland. After taking care of all the formalities, the next morning we could go hunting. In addition to Archie and the two of us, another two hunters arrived with the helicopter. One of them would be hunting with a bow and the other with rifle. They had arrived to fill up their game meat stocks for the winter. Both of them wanted to shoot a nice and well-fed moose. As it seemed, we were about to have fierce competition. Three keen hunters had gathered in the camp. Two of them were bow hunting. We were slightly worried by the fact that we would be competing for the animals by the lake, on whose shore the lodge was constructed. We knew from experience that moose are capable of traveling great distances when they are in their mating season. This was the time at which we were hunting, the season's peak. When it came to our accommodation, we had the best of everything. A magnificent five-star lodge, incredibly tasty and abundant food, polite and hospitable hosts along with other guests. We just needed a little bit of luck and we would collect up close and personal video pictures of the way hunting heaven looks like. Only a few minutes and we'll be able to see over across there, right? We started with two, added Steve and I and the guides, crossing the lake by boat. The speed of the boat and the crosswind blew my hat overboard, but they were all polite enough to go back so that I could pick it up after I told them this was my lucky hat and without it we were doomed to failure. Steve prudently prepared for meeting the fiercest predator there, the mosquitoes. Our march began. According to plan, all of us together were about to enter the endless marshes and tundra fields covered by low shrubs, moss, and lichen. There, everyone was exposed to danger if moving on his own. The hidden swamps and water pockets under the seemingly stable turf cover were lethal traps stalking the careless intruder. And the deep slits hidden underneath the resilient shrubs and rocks could easily break a leg or something worse could happen. The hostile but beautiful nature had not by chance lured and pushed away colonizers from Spain, France, and England for more than a century. It wasn't until the 18th century that due to the development of the fishing industry, permanent settlements were established there. The first Newfoundland inhabitants were probably the predecessors of the Indians Beothuk and Mi'kmaq that are occupied with fishing and hunting even today. The place from which we were performing the scanning of the surrounding territory was not chosen by chance. The many years of experience of our hunting guide, Loman Pady, brought us there. We had already discovered several moose on the horizon, as well as a caribou. But Steve was the one to make the most interesting discovery. At the nearby uphill, thickly overgrown with shrubs, exactly from where we came, he saw the glare of a bull's large spades. The first hunter to try out his luck was the one with the less noisy weapon, in order not to frighten the other animals around. As always, a female could have been the reason for spoiling the surprise. The cow was capable of warning of our presence, but obviously the animal was young enough not to have seen people and was just sitting and observing us with eyes fixed on us. The moose has obviously not seen us. Its full attention was attracted by the female that started moving along the slope. We couldn't have made it to it in time. The ground on the path we needed to take was too open, and even if it didn't happen to see us, blinded by the love magic, the female was about to discover us for sure. We were in a dead-end street, but not for long. 
Our hunting guide was ready to imitate a moose's love calling. The hill, thickly covered by low shrubs, ended up in a ravine. It was already raining heavily. The wind also got stronger and thunder tore the skies. The noise was unimaginable, and we didn't stand a chance of hearing the approaching animal, even if it weighed more than half a ton. I couldn't see anything because of the rain, but Philip Sampson showed me the glares of the moose's wet spades at several meters from the other side of the ravine on the opposite hill. The sound that quite resembled an angry male obviously made the moose we were observing quite furious. It left the female alone and with slow and swaying step headed straight towards the source of the battle calling. I had hidden as much as I could behind Archie and millimeters behind me I could hear the hunting guide puffing and moaning. The male was obviously preparing for a battle. It was in the perfect shooting position, but the great distance, the high junipers, and the strong wind were about to make the bow shot quite risky. That's why Archie decided to wait for a better opportunity. Soon we lost sight of the moose when it got down in the gully at 50 meters ahead of us. For some time, we decided it had given up but soon it appeared in all its magnificence. Right in front of us, and not more than 20 meters. That was close, even dangerously close for the bow hunter. The arrow could not stop an attacking colossus like this one, 
Furthermore, the moose was facing us. It got surprised by that movement and instinctively jumped and withdrew. Archie, inspired by his luck, made another step and moved his hand again. The moose didn't try again to mess with the two-legged creature in front of it. Obviously, it didn't trust that animal, an animal it hadn't seen until then. The male ran at a trot through the shrubs while following the female that had prudently observed the scene from farther away. Okay, this is Monday morning, first day of the season. Uh, uh, <laughs> first day of the season and it's raining and we can't go too far from camp, but uh, we're here for seven days. You know, that moose on day six, seven, we'd be taking, but uh, there are bigger moose here. Has, has been hunted in nine years? No, nope. we'll give it a try for another few days. Yeah. And later on in the week, like you said, if we see one. He's, he's right by the lake. Yep, Thursday or Friday. There's no competition. There's, no, there's only 300s in camp. And, uh, you know, so um, we'll come back in day five, six, seven, because we're not getting out of here for a week. Cool. Stay tuned. We'll be back uh, moose hunting here in Newfoundland, Middle Lake. And uh, make a call. Make a call. I mean, that's spectacular, spectacular. End of, end of uh, September, early October. Call them right in, Phil. Yeah. Thanks, Rod. Thank you. Everybody coming out to watch the plane. <laughs> the plane, the plane. In the last two days, spent under the scattered rain of Newfoundland, many things happened. The hunters traveled tens of kilometers in their forests and swamps in search for their animal. They fell and got back up many times under the pouring rain. They were enjoying the incredible views, colored by fairy tale rainbows in the endless tundra. But most importantly, each and every hunter managed to harvest the cherished trophies and acquire literally as much meat as they could carry. In the airplane that had arrived four days earlier than scheduled, the general manager of Big River Camps was arriving, namely Judy Nomore. She had arrived to greet us on our success, success that outstripped even our most daring wishes. It seems that Judy had come to greet us, as well as to stock up on our rum supplies that were quickly to end with the numerous occasions for celebration. Hi. Thank you for everything, Judy. After the treat and the light lunch, it was time for heroic storytelling full of hunting feats and jokes. Thanks for everything, Judy. Only that this time, the adventures were real and each of them was sealed by the hundreds of photos and tens of video hours. It's your turn to see the story of the three hunters that ended their hunting successes all in less than 24 hours. Modern trophy hunting differs in one thing from our predecessors hunting. 
Back then, they used to hunt because they wanted to get cheap food for their table. Nowadays, the trophy hunters pay tens and even hundreds of times the market value of the meat of the animals hunted by them, not because they need that badly the last real natural organic meat, but because thanks to this charity, they help protect the habitat and sustain animals themselves. Relative to wildlife conservation, the large hunting organizations such as the Safari Club have the highest contribution in promoting ethical hunting norms. As a rule, club members try to harvest only the oldest bulls. In order to monitor this factor, the hunters have a system for assessing the hunting trophies, which allows all hunters to see and compare documented measurements and the location of all trophy animals taken by them. This measurement cannot be performed by everyone. Trophy assessment can only be performed by an official measurer. Fortunately, the two of us with Archie were official measurers and were about to document the exact sizes of the hunter's trophies on the spot. The registration of the data about the harvested animals, their age, the size of their antlers, and even the exact spot where they've been hunted could help with the statistical data about scientifically reasoned plans for development and preservation of the species being hunted. This is the only accurate and proven practice that has resulted in the recovery of many more near-extinct species. If absolute hunting prohibition is levied on animal species or territory, they are certainly almost immediately doomed to extinction. Fortunately, here in Canada, as well as in the USA, hunters' strong influence would never allow the large corporations to take away the habitats of the wild species that are being hunted the way this happens in Western Europe and in most African countries. They would not allow breaking their traditions and rules to practice their favorite hobby, hunting. That's why our friends are so proud with the trophies they have taken. They have the right to call themselves wildlife protectors. Excitement, feel the danger, share the 